Discover your inner goddess and live up to your highest value and most abundant potential. Welcome to Grateful Goddesses, a podcast that empowers you to unleash your inner goddess and take the leap of faith to live your best life. Your guide, Karen Pulver, joins her fellow goddesses in soulful conversations about gratitude, personal growth, authentic living, and a bevy of topics affecting women today. Let's start the show with your host, Karen Pulver. Welcome everyone to Grateful Goddesses. And if you're like me, you love the movies. I love the movies. In fact, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the movies. And I'm going to tell you why. My parents met at the movies. They went to a blind date to see Psycho. And my mom told me that she was so scared at that movie that she leaned into my dad. And my dad, of course, had his arm around her on their first date. And that was it. Instant magic because of Psycho. My mom also remembers the bra that that Janet Lee wore, and she said that it was called the Bally Bra, and that stuck in her mind of <laughs> remembering the first date with my dad. So then moving on, when I was a little girl, when I turned 11, I'll never forget going for my birthday party. It was so exciting to go for a birthday party to the movies, and we went to go see Oh God, and Oh God with George Burns, and I remember that was transformative for me because I never really thought about God. And all of a sudden, God was this like old man, at least in the movies. But it got me thinking about God, deeply about God. Like, why is God in the movies a man? Why not a woman? Why not? Why is he white? I mean, all of these these things started to really, really get me thinking when I was 11 years old. So I'm going to bring on our featured goddesses today because before we introduce our guest, I want to just chat about some of the movies that have influenced us when we were younger. So if our featured goddesses, Alyssa, Dina, and Rachel can join us, I'd like to ask them, what is a movie or two that really um, was inspiring for you that you can remember? So Dina, how about you? Um, So I, I mean, I, I feel like we were like blessed in the 80s with the amount of great movies that were out there. And, and I really just can't focus on one. And I vacillate between the whole St. Elmo's Fire about last night world, as well as the whole Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, 16 Candles. Um, that seemed to be very, just memories of me of, of the movies that I rewatched and rewatched and, and Heather's. I don't know where that fits in, but that, that, that was another oh, one. And, and you don't know what, yeah, Heather's was amazing with Christian Slater. You know, I would say the high school stuff just was getting me ready for high school. And that's what I guess made me think about, you know, things and what high school would look like. I don't have any greater influences necessarily, just great memories. And the Breakfast Club, I too remember with all the different characters in high school and when, and looking right. at my it's high school, and, yeah. different groups. But yeah. also when you think about it, it really was not diverse. No. Right? I'm like Very thinking important. back. Right. Alyssa, what was your movie that influenced you growing up? Um, I'm going to go back even further um, to the 70s and uh, 1978 and Greece. I mean, Greece was really? like, for me, amazing. I love this whole sort of like musical and a movie, like all wrapped up in one. That was kind of a new thing for me. I hadn't really seen a lot of um, musicals on, t- on in, the, in the movies. And, um, you know, like a lot of, you know, pre-teen girls at the time, I probably fell in love with John Travolta and loved Olivia Newton-John and the music and I just, uh, that one really stuck with me. And then for years later, every time it was on, I had to watch. Do you know that I, Mm -hmm. um, in one of my dance shows, I was Sandy. (laughs) Ah. (laughs) You'll have to do your routine Oh my gosh, yeah. So Rachel, how about you? I was just going to add though to Greece. I remember going to the movie theater and like looking at my watch, hoping it wasn't going to be over yet. Like I just loved every second of that. And John Travolta and I share a birthday. And oh, I yeah. always like, I mean, I found that out later in life when I no longer had a crush on him. But um, <laughs> do you have another movie that you that was inspiring for you or that you remember? I love the, the movie The World According to Garp. John Irving is like one of my favorite authors. And I just, I don't know, I loved his writing. And it was so kooky and weird and different characters. And The World According to Garp, I just always... It struck me, I think growing up in a small town and, and, and not seeing a lot of weirdness around and all those different characters and all they experienced, like 
for years and years and years, that was always my favorite movie. It just struck me. So it's, it's interesting now, right? When we think about the movies that we used to love, like Grease, I remember loving it too. But then as I got older, I was like, hey, why did she have to change into the sexy yeah. character smoking and all of that, right? And yeah. Breakfast Club, the same thing. Like, why is that the nerdy guy? Like, he actually probably like did the best in all those characters like in his life it's just so funny like to think about now looking back so thank you so much for sharing goddesses i'm going to just uh introduce our guest now in a minute so our guest today is nick davis and i met nick because i was invited to join a movie group here in chicago by a dear dear friend of mine she called me up and said hey you need to come and invite three friends we need some new perspectives you need to join this group and i was so grateful to her because not only were the women just so it's just so thoughtful it's such an amazing discussion but this man <laughs> nick davis i mean i can't he is the ultimate goddess i have to say goddess i mean i know he's male but i feel that he embodies everything that a goddess embodies, which he seems, he's intellectual, he's strong, he's beautiful inside and out, he's empowered, he's creative, he's just amazing. He was also a writer and contributing editor at Film Comet Magazine from 2016 to 2020 and has published his own film reviews at www.nick davis.com since 1998. Nick earned his BA in English at Harvard University in 1999 and his PhD in English with a certificate in film and video studies from Cornell University in 2005. From 2017 to 2020, he held the NU Alumni Training Professorship, Northwestern's highest award for classroom teaching. He has also written one book called The Desiring Image, Gilles Deleuze and Contemporary Queer Cinema in 2013, which placed changing trends in on-screen sexuality in the decades after AIDS into new dialogues with academic theories about individual desires, interpersonal collectives, and power relations. So welcome, Nick, to the show. Hello, Karen. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, when I called you a goddess, how do you feel about that? 101% thrilled. <laughs> okay, good. Tell me a little bit about your passion for movies. I want to know what started uh, you just loving movies. Like, what was your first movie that you can remember that you really were inspired by? I was thinking about that while I was listening to the other answers. And... Um, it, it's such a, I was, I must have been such a weird kid because I remember being eight and begging my parents to take me to see Children of a Lesser God because right. we had been watching TV together and the Oscars happened. I didn't know what they were. And I watched this 19 year old or 21 year old deaf girl in horn rim glasses and baby's breath who looked like a nerd. And I thought I was a nerd and she's winning an award on TV. Yeah for this movie with this crazy title that I couldn't even start to imagine. Who are the children of a lesser God? Who's the lesser God? I think I have to see this. And, um, and so my parents kind of snuck me into the theater because we were living on a small military base and they thought maybe some other parents will think it's odd that they're taking their eight-year-old to this R-rated love story on- Oh, adult. that's right, it was R-rated, that's right. It was R-rated, yeah. And like the first <laughs> thing that happens in the movie is Marley Matlin's naked body swimming by <laughs> the pool. That's right. Um, but I remember from that moment and then getting to talk with them about it afterward, it must have been one of those moments they've said for them where you kind of find out who your kids are and what they're interested in. And, and we talked about so many things we didn't usually talk about that I was kind of hooked from that point forward. But, but Breakfast Club, for sure. I almost wanted to make the dandruff and cereal sandwich, you know, run the podcast, but I won't. And oh, I love that. Not to see Steel Magnolias like two mm. or three times on this Marine base when it was in the theaters because I just thought it was so fun. So, and then what led you to continue on your journey to um, your professor at Northwestern University? But what what led you into do, to studying and and um, doing what you do today? I was definitely such a reader before I was a moviegoer, and we didn't even have a VCR for a long time in the house. Um, and living on this military base in Germany, I started reading all these books about people who made movies before I really could see the film. And when I started getting interested in all that was the year that Catherine Hepburn's memoir came out. And I didn't really know who she was, but someone told me, if you're getting interested in this, you should read that. 
And so it really was through the prism of people like her and, and her especially, but, but Betty Davis and all the screen goddesses, right? That um, right. not only learning about their work um, and all the work they did to have the careers that they had, but how Catherine Hepburn's own performance of self was kind of a bit of artistry and that she was really conscious of the persona she wanted to put out in the world, even if her own life was a little different and more complicated than she admitted. And so I just remember being hooked on the drama of the movies when I started seeing them and, and on the kind of drama of the lives that go into making a movie or having a career and especially around the women who always seem to have more to balance and more they were negotiating and keeping a career going, but they also seem like the stars that really lasted with people for decades and decades. We're going to bring on our future goddesses because we want to cover so much about film. I mean, this may be a couple podcasts, but we're going to try and squeeze it into one. And we want to ha ask you some questions. I wanted to first ask you, how do you feel that women's roles have changed in movies? Like when we were talking about um, I'm even thinking back to Flashdance and Pretty Woman. Those were movies that I loved too. But I always felt like, well, why, as I got older, I'm like, well, why are they being rescued like by these men? But that was what I grew up with. So I felt like I need to be rescued by this man, you know, but it's changed over time, of course. So how do you feel that women's roles have changed in movies over time? I think one of the biggest impressions made on me just and more and more all the time is how up and down those cycles have been over the years, you know, because in the 30s and 40s, there was no question that that female actors and and women driven stories were the center of the business. And they were also the primary audience. And so, you know, male leads were aspiring to be in a Betty Davis movie. Um, Humphrey Bogart swept out the stable of Betty Davis's ranch house. And that was his first kind of significant credit. And he was so thrilled to be there. And wow, I didn't know that. If you look at the, at just like the lists of best picture nominees in the thirties and forties, six or seven of the 10 were movies that revolved around Greer Garson or, or Rosalind Russell or, or Catherine Hepburn or whoever it might have been. So it was a real change um, over time that we started, and especially around the mid 70s, that sort of teenage boys and their imagined tastes really came to dominate everything. I think because I was such a little tiny Oscar nerd in the 80s, I was both taking in all the movies we were just talking about. But also, you know, going to things like broadcast news and, and seeing terms of endearment and realizing later that the 80s were kind of a peak period where a Meryl Streep or a Jessica Lange or a Sissy Spacek could build a career playing women you might easily know in your own life and the dramas that came out of that working life or personal life or, or a regional conflict where they lived could drive a whole career because there were plenty of those movies being made. And so there was the kind of coexistence of how is that happening at the same time as all of these rescue fantasies that you're talking. It's hard to remember things like everybody thinking Meryl Streep's career was starting to phase out at the end of the 80s and that she was starting to do comedies out of desperation to stay relevant. And no one could imagine what an actress after turning 40 and then again after turning 50 was going to do. And so quite a lot has changed in terms of the longevity of some women's careers, but it's a smaller set of women I think mm -hmm. we've been able to keep that going um, mm -hmm. without moving to TV. And so then as I started studying it more in school and realizing that the silent era was full of women directors and women were the principal editors of most people's movies and really had a lot of hand in shaping what movies that might have a male director, they were really the ones putting it together. So it's, it's such a zigzag all the time. Alyssa, what would you like to ask? Hi, Nick. Um, so... Yeah, it seems like Hi. then we came into this period of like the 90s and the 2000s and it became, we kind of swung back to like male dominated roles, like, you know, movies where the lead, what the lead protagonist was male. And um, I was reading a little bit about, you know, studies that have been done that showed that the top grossing movies from even the last few years, 2014 to 2017, maybe 2018, um, with women leads out earned movies in all budget levels um, than movies that starred men. And so it seems to refute the idea that women led movies make less money, right? And so I'm trying to understand, 
you know, why, even though we saw the 30s and the 40s, and you even talked about like the 70s and the 80s, why we've sort of, why the pendulum has swung back to now, like just putting out these movies that um, have male dominated roles. I mean, even in, you know, the world of the Me Too movement, I know that, that, that the number of women directors and the number of women leads has increased, but it's still um, trailing behind male lead movies. And I don't know why Hollywood would want to leave money on the table knowing that those other movies with women, you know, protagonists out earn the other ones. So I'm confused. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so, it's so confounding to everybody who cares about these issues, right? And, and feeling like if, if we only have to make it about money, that too should make the argument for the exact reasons that you're saying. But every time a Devil Wears Prada or a Mamma Mia or a Hunger Games, you know, wherever you want to go, every time one of those huge smashes happens, first we have to live through people's month of articles being surprised when it's not really clear to me why anybody was surprised that everybody wanted to go see all of those films. But then these totally uniquely focused, so what made the Devil Wears Prada so successful? And they're always treated as these unicorns when that's not the kind of pressure put on any sort of male-driven blockbuster. It's just presumed that they will do well unless nobody liked them, and so then they tank. And part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that after the whole industry changed in the wake of the Jaws, Star Wars, Exorcist invention of the blockbuster, which has only amplified over time, and now the superhero phenomenon has, has aggravated that further, that um, it's interesting hearing stories from filmmakers who say, I want to make this story about this married couple or about this teacher or about this community protest, and I'm going to need $25 million to be able to make it. And hearing from studios, we will support it if you can figure out a way for it to cost $75 million because then it'll be big and splashy and spectacular with more famous stars, or we'll take you down to $5 million. But we can't deal with this stuff in the middle. Nobody just wants a movie about people talking to each other. And I personally will sprint to a movie about people talking to each other. And a lot of movies, not to paint in overly broad strokes, but a lot of movies written by women and that women are interested in directing and starring in emerge out of a lot of interpersonal complexity and dialogue and, and situations that can't easily be inflated to some $100 million action spectacular even though we've seen that women can lead those and direct those as well, right? So some of it has to do with Hollywood's nervousness. And, and in the last decade, 10 or 15 years, I guess, the fate of a lot of those projects is to say, why don't we make that a series? Um, either a sort of four-part installment miniseries or turn it into damages or the closer. But movies have not wanted to support that kind of budget bracket, which means entire genres where women tend to be most showcased fall out. It even took like a million superhero movies for, you know, Gal Gadot to appear on the screen as Wonder Woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even in those big blockbusters, they tend to be, you know, the male lead. Absolutely. And then again, it was like shock that Wonder Woman had been successful when who doesn't <laughs> love, find me five people who don't love Wonder Woman. It's going right. to take us, you know, um, but it's still kind of seen as a rare bird for some reason. Um, so I'm wondering how you're feeling or talking about this conversation about changing Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I usually wind up in those kinds of conversations where I think that conversation has wound up about, I don't know how much it always helps to take something totally out of circulation, except things that are only made to be egregious, you know, like they're, they're, pieces of propaganda and things that it's hard to imagine how it benefits to keep circulating them. But for something like that, um, and I'm actually pretty good friends with the, the professor at University of Chicago, Jackie Stewart of African American Cinema, who's the person that, that um, I think it's HBO Max, right? That was showing Gone with the Wind and then it was pulled. And she's who they asked to come give a taped introduction about, you know, as a black woman film scholar, I teach this film all the time. I am really indebted to things about this film. There are also things about this film that I hated when I was 10 and I hate them now 40 years later, but we're not gonna get anywhere not having conversations about all of that. And then the, the question of, yes, the black characters who are in Gone with the Wind are existing within pretty familiar stereotypes that were already familiar by that point. Hattie McDaniel was already fed up by 1939 of playing a maid yet again, but there are also more of them who have named speaking roles and multiple dialogue scenes and who you start to get to know as characters. There's not just one. 
-hmm. It's amazing that that has to count as something to aspire to. That there's not just one, right? But there's a lot of historical value in seeing those artists at work and thinking about why was this by far the most successful commercial American film that ever existed? What does it mean that it played continuously in one Atlanta theater for 65 years? And if you can't see it and you're just trying to have the conversation in the abstract, it's, it's hard to get to the bottom of any of that. And sometimes I think people are maybe being lowballed that when we talk about audiences, we're worried about the effects these movies have on them. When we think about our own reactions to things, we're fully comfortable being ambivalent or having, you know, I used to love it, now I hate it. I've always kind of loved, hated it. I go back and forth. I like it, but I'm not sure I'd show it to my kids. Like, I think all, people are used to complicated reactions, but the way the industry runs acts as though that's not the case and that things are just going to be good for us or bad for us. So I was, I was glad to see that it was brought back with the kind of framing that asks people to treat this as complicated. I How agree. I'm glad to. Yeah. I'm glad that we have it to teach to and talk about and change it later you know there's a lot of movies though that sh that need to do that right like do you feel like can you name off the top of your head <laughs> some other movies that you think would deserve like to be pulled like that and reframed megan kelly who's not someone i usually look to for for thought provocations i'm going to sit with for a while i had to give her credit for saying you know if we so how about if we start taking out of circulation all the movies where women are portrayed as objects or vessels, mm -hmm. uh, are we gonna have four movies left? Um, mm -hmm. And partially for those kinds of reasons, I tend to wanna err on the side of bringing into circulation all kinds of work that exists that, that we don't know about um, and that doesn't get circulated. So rather than pull things and make them unavailable to see all this work that, that women filmmakers, that black filmmakers, we're doing as early as the teens and 20s um, that's only started to bubble up on Netflix um, or, or come out in restored versions on DVDs to realize there was some study done, I think last year, that there were 10 movies from the 1940s that are available on Netflix. And there were like six from the 50s. And, it, you know, Casablanca, Ten Commandments, whatever. But there are entire decades where if you were trying to get interested in movies now, and wanted to see something earlier than what came out in the last couple decades, you would have no shot um, based on our streaming services. And with that goes a whole lot of history of people being more represented and less represented at different times. You know, my students, I remember recently teaching the career of Seisu Hayakawa, who was the Japanese American actor for whom the term sex symbol was invented in the movies in the 20s. And his roles were the ones that that huge audiences, especially white women audiences, were flocking to see. And when they asked him, you know, how do we keep you? What, what do you want? He said, I'd like to be able to direct. And so in the early 20s, we have a Japanese American sexy guy who's starring in the box, the top box office films and making his own films. And who knows about that if you, if you don't work well, specifically in film history? Well, and it's the same with blackface. Um, if we pulled all those, we, we wouldn't, be able to educate our children and in, in describing like this is what was popular and this was what was shown and seen as normal at that yeah. time. And right? it, that might be a good example of something that I guess uh, on the Gone with the Wind example that Dina brought up, I could imagine, you know, there's so many TV channels, there are so many streaming options. Sometimes you just who knows why you're encountering what you encounter in terms of what happens to be on like if there were a targeted evening or day of saying, let's look at these blackface driven comedies and, and think a little bit and have some, you know, back and forth with the host of the cable show of what does this mean? How can we talk about it? So people aren't being totally left to their own devices to try to grapple with it. But I, I rarely think pulling things is the, is the best strategy because people find them anyway too, right? They find them and it's good to have discussions about it and learn from it and teach our children you know, about it. I'm curious, when you were saying um, about, you know, a lot of female movies are, are more about dialogue and a little slower, and I feel that, like, during this time of, of quarantine and the time of kind of racial uprising, that we're all, we're, we're like on pause, and we're all thinking, and we've all kind of, I feel woken up, and, and it doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum, you are analyzing yourself and things more differently. And I'm wondering 
like what you would love to envision that the film industry will mirror will mirror in this kind of like philosophy philosophical time and time of awakening like what kind of movies or programming do you see that could be coming forward as, as a result of this time hmm. that's a great question a few things that come to mind one are that i would imagine that for for sheerly health related reasons the last kind of movie you'd want to make right now is one where there are five thousand people on the set interacting with each other and a huge catering table and maybe making Iron Man 16 is really hard right now, but figuring out how to make a movie, I almost don't even care who's in it. I mean, I do, but any movie you wanna make about three or four people trying to push through a tough situation that lots of people out here can identify with is a movie I'll always wanna see and that seems to be underrepresented now. And it may be that the conditions of production are going to encourage smaller scales and um, and more controllable situations. So I wonder about that. It's also been interesting. There's a movie called, I haven't seen it yet, called The Old Guard that just debuted on Netflix this week. The woman who directed it, Gina Prince by the Wood, African-American filmmaker, said, for 20 years, I've actually done pretty well. I think she's made seven movies that have been released commercially, and several of them have done quite well commercially. And said, but then I would always go see these superhero action blockbusters and... I love those movies and wished that I were really, I felt skilled at being able to make them. And then in the last two years, I thought, why am I telling myself that? The reason I don't know how to make them is because nobody's ever asked me to make one. And then set about for two years, making the case that she should get a shot. And Charlize Theron, who's one of the actors in Hollywood working the hardest, I think, to bring more people into every tent, said, I'm in if you're in. And so some of these even stereotypes, right, of what kinds of movies do, do women most want to make or do black filmmakers most want to make have so much to do with even our own internalized stereotypes of what our own group that we belong to or some other group have been doing for so long when they're allowed to do anything that it starts to seem natural. And I would just love to see more people say, wouldn't it be more interesting to ask this filmmaker over here to take a stab. We've never seen this kind of story from that perspective, or we've never seen it built around an actor who looks like this or set in this part of the world. And there's just no reason not to. I have to say that Dina just sent a little chat to you, which I saw, which by the way, will be shown on YouTube, but that's, I'm going to keep it in. I'm not going to edit it out because she said- everybody though. She yeah. said, I want to take your class. <laughs> we Bye. all- exactly. <laughs> I am not taking that out because I have to tell you, right? Nick is just in sync and that's what I love about him. He just, he's so passionate about what he does. He, he I mean, you can just, it's totally, if we ask you, I can't even say the words. We ask you about a movie and you just go dive right deep into it and the heart and soul of it. And yes, we all want to take his class, right? We want to go back to college and take his class for sure. Well, I'm so excited to be in this class. You know, I'm so curious <laughs> what everybody else's views are about all this because right. I, I know how many of you are, are teachers now or have been in the past. And Dean, I think early childhood, you will preschool, mm -hmm. I guess I just learned. And um, I know that so many of these interests come from, from the teachers and from my parents at early ages. I think I was in second grade when my mom bought me a card deck at the newly opened African and African American Art Museum at the Smithsonian. And it was 52... African Americans across history and like all the diamonds were scientists and all the hearts were artists or something like that. And it came with a little wow. booklet that just described them all. And to, you know, you read about Harriet Tubman as somebody who's seven years old and think this seems conspicuously more interesting than any, anything I'm hearing about on the news of, of reasons why people are famous or to read about Sojourner Truth or Frederick Douglass. And, and to be exposed at such an early age to all kinds of lives that have been lived and what people have been up against and superseded, I know directly informed um, why I always wanted popular entertainment to be testifying more diversely to, to what people's lives have been like. So I'm curious, you know, as whether in your work lives or as teachers or as parents, like how have you felt about that? Um, about what do you introduce when, or, or what's what to you is too early to take a, a child or a student to a movie that might seem a little adult, but might be their best shot at seeing something that's not the same old formula over and over again. Well, I will tell you that I took both my daughters 
to an R-rated movie and it was the biggest mistake of my life. And I'm going to get the title wrong, but it's, I think it's called a, No Strings Attached or something with oh, Natalie Portman. That's Natalie Portman, sort of friends with benefits. <laughs> yeah, they were begging me to take them. And I snuck them in and I heard this woman behind me saying, who would bring kids here? And mm -hmm. I did. And I had to leave. It was too much information for them. It was just way too much. Like, and I'm pretty open with my girls about sexuality, but this was just not, it was not a good idea. Not the right thing. I was going to say, well, first of all, I was obsessed with Harriet Tubman in grade school. I read every book in the library about Harriet Tubman. And it's so funny. I just told my kids that story the other day. Like it just kind of, something came up and I was like, you have no idea how much I love Harriet Tubman. <laughs> so it's so funny that you brought that up. It just re reminded me. But um, I have three teenage boys and, um, and it's really hard um, to get them to watch anything that I like. But I started this tradition on Mother's Day that I make them see a movie with me. And we, um, a few years ago, we saw the RGB documentary and oh, I had them go. And so that's just kind of been my way because I, I never get a say in what movie we're watching. And I have very, they all love sports. I mean, they all have like this commonality that I, and I, you can't pay me to watch sports on TV. So I kind of miss out on that dynamic. But when I insert myself, like there's moments where I can just say, this is what we're doing. And that's, our, that's been our tradition lately for Mother's Day now. That's great. How did they react to that movie? I don't think they were so shocked. I feel that we grow, we, like we have an environment where we talk about news, like we, they're, so it wasn't like so shocking. Again, I don't think they would have ever chosen to see the movie on their right. own, but they enjoyed right. it. I mean, we had a good conversation, but I can't remember of anything being so like shocking to them, right. no, you know? No, for sure. And I think oh, living in sorry. Chicago, um, I feel that like it, being urban kids, as much as Chicago is a segregated city, I still feel that the urban experience, you you know, there's there's a lot of diversity in our neighborhood and they take public transportation and there's a lot of exposure. So I just feel that you're just adding more flavor to, to their worlds, but they see a fair amount. Mm. Alyssa. My sons are 22 and almost 20 and I can't remember. I'm thinking, what's the last time we all like went to a movie theater together and saw something. But obviously now we're all home in the same, you know, under the same roof and watching a lot of television together and Netflix and all the various streaming services. So it's actually been a treat that we can, that we've had this time that we, you know, probably wouldn't other without COVID, we would, we'd be running in a million different directions and we wouldn't have all this time. And we love movies as, you know, as a family and we love these long series and gosh, watched Game of Thrones start to finish together and, you know, all of that. And, and we love it. Um, but to your point about, you know, as a parent and when they're young and they're growing up and Karen, you know, taking your girls to an R-rated movie. I mean, I think the oldest ones, right. They, they're the ones that sort of, you know, we probably parent the best because they're mm -hmm. the ones that like you're, it's not age appropriate. We're not going to do that. I'm not going to take you to that. That one had bad language. That one had sex scenes. But then by the time you get to number two, right? And, you know, in, in your case, Rachel, number three, it's like they just grow up a lot faster, right? They just start watching whatever it is that uh, the older ones, what, what's appropriate for the older ones. So I think my younger son definitely started seeing some stuff on TV and in the movies that my older son did not at that same age. So, um, it, it is really interesting how much, you know, you can use these movies as um, jumping off points to, to have these conversations and to talk about this stuff. But um, for me, um, I, just, I just love any time we can all sit down together and, and, and watch something and talk about it after. And now, of course, they're, they're adults, they're fully grown. And so now sort of the sky's the limit on what we can see and what we can talk about. And, and we've had some really good discussions mm -hmm. recently. So I... I have three kids, 14, 15, and 17. Um, and back when they were a little bit littler, I, I tended to go to common sense media. Yeah, and that was sort of my barometer uh -huh. and my excuse. Um, but we also, since they've been little up until now, my husband just has this, this line during any show where he says, okay, guys, cover your eyes. And they still do it at 17, almost 16 and 14. They still go like this, you know, uh -huh. no matter what it is, if it's gore, if it's sex, if it's, language um, to appease us. But, you know, I mean, listen, we don't have controls on our 
um, televisions or computers or iPads and my kids spend time alone on their devices. Um, they surely tell me they're watching Grey's Anatomy and whatnot, but I were a little loose with sort of the um, idea of it. But um, we, we have always loved to sit down as a family and watch the shows on Netflix or the movies. Um, and we do a pretty good job between, I have two girls and a boys in the middle. We've agreed to not watch The Kissing Booth with my son, but huh? we, we found a lot of common, uh, everyone loves the Marvel comics and other series together. So it's great. I mean, it's a big, big part of our existence for sure. And it changes over time. I mean, when I talk about my favorite movie later, I watched it yesterday again with my now 22 year old daughter. And she had some comments. She was like, mom, this is really sexist. You like this movie? That look, it's horrible. Like, and I was like, you're ruining it. I've always loved this movie where well, you're ruining it for me. And she just kept, she walked out of the room. She wouldn't continue watching it with me. She's like, there's no way I'm not even putting this into my, my being and you shouldn't have either. And I'm like, oh God, like I love this movie, but we'll talk about that after. Um, <laughs> Since you all mentioned the, um, the sort of breakfast club, 16 candles. Yeah. 80s formation. I don't know if you read the, the article that Molly Ringwald wrote in the New Yorker maybe two years ago, um, where she said, I've been, I've been embarrassed how much I am looking forward to the moment of showing my daughter all these movies, and I can't figure out if she's quite old enough. I was, she's kind of preteen, and, and both right. because I'm not sure if she's ready, but also because I just feel like I'm bragging or I'm impatient, and, like, and she's going to be like, it's just my mom. I don't care. And they finally sat down and watched them when I think her daughter reflected some interest in seeing this stuff. And she said, I'd, I'd spent all this time being worried that she wasn't going to relate to these films or they were just gonna seem dated or I was gonna seem super lame. And then she had the opposite experience to what you're describing, Karen, where Molly Ringwald was saying, I don't know why there's a scene in The Breakfast Club where Judd Nelson's character is fingering me underneath the table and that's played for laughs while the principal is in there lecturing all of us or why this scene that looks a lot like, you know, the, there's something in 16 candles about a girl who's unconscious and like a guy who's been aspiring to lose his virginity for a long time. And I think that's how he winds up losing his virginity. And she said, my daughter was eating all this stuff up. She was so proud of me and, and loved all these movies and totally related to them and said everybody in the Breakfast Club reminded her of people she went to school with. And I was kind of watching them with new eyes mm -hmm. and remembering that even when I was 17 and was in this odd position that my movies were making money, so I was probably the only 17-year-old girl on a movie set in Hollywood who the director was asking, hey, what do you think? And John Hughes was always so great about that, except when I observed that I thought something was sexist. And that was the one topic on which he would get defensive. Or he would say, well, you got to think about the audience. And there were many fewer of those episodes than there would be now as I watched the movie again. So it was just curious seeing, you know, who's watching through what lens. Um, and her daughter saying, mom, I think you're taking this all too seriously. I think my friends and I all know this is not real life. This would not be funny if it really happened in the context of The Breakfast Club. Like, I understand why this is a joke. And, and it's a really thoughtfully written um, essay. Maybe I'll, I'll try to dig it up and send it. I would love to. I would love to add it to the Goddess website for our viewers and listeners to read. I wanted to jump into LGBTQ movies. Mm -hmm. um, I have so many questions about that. And uh, Goddesses, if you do as well, please join in. But um, what have you seen? You know, I was, I was trying to look back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and I couldn't really find much. Um, but I know that that it was there. I just don't really, I couldn't find it. I'm just curious about, about those types of films. And of course now you see more, but um, I wanna know how, how they've uh, developed over the years. If you see more happening, what are your thoughts on that? One of my favorite classes to teach is, a, is an introduction to queer cinema or LGBT cinema. And the, the biggest shock at the beginning is that we're starting back in 1919. And it's not even the kinds of movies that you'll see from, you know, as we move forward, we get to the, to the late 30s and 40s and 50s, and there are movies where you think, okay, this film isn't saying it, but clearly this boy in Tea and Sympathy or, or this girl and member of the wedding, I think if we were allowed, we would say gay character, lesbian character, but the movie's not there yet. Right. The movie from the teens and 20s, coming from 
many different places in the world, especially in Germany, were court trials about targets of homophobia and blackmail for being gay and taking the course to taking the case to trial and real life sex experts and psychologists playing themselves saying homophobia is disgusting and we can't treat people this way. We're losing some of our greatest minds and some of our best artists because we're hounding them out of public life for this aspect of, of their being that's completely natural and much more common than you all admit. And understandably, my students just cannot believe that this was, that's not coded, it's not euphemistic. And so that too has been sort of up and down. There's a movie I saw for the first time in Turner Classic Movies called Boy What a Girl from 1947 that's set in Harlem. It's an all black cast, black directed movie from the late 40s. And there are two brothers who are sort of piano players and musicians and maybe tap dancers who are trying to impress two sisters and they can't quite get an act together that's good enough to wow these gals until they ask their friend down the hall who they never say, is he a cross-dresser? Is he a trans character? Why is he always in dresses and wigs? But he's, that's just who he is and he's a great singer and comes and joins their act and, and it winds up raising all this money for the community, I think. So it's another history that I think because there's so little in circulation and because I think a lot of us, even when we try to act differently, are pretty wedded to the idea that things just get better over time and that, you know, yeah my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation didn't talk about X or weren't aware of Y, and now finally we are. You know, when I talk to my grandparents about this stuff, that's not what I learn, and when I see more movies, it's not what I learn. So, and I notice that with my students too, once, and it's not just my students, it's with me, um, once you get over the first hump of why have we been so invisible, and that can often put you in a situation right where any movie that has a female lead or a gay character or a black director, you're just so starved for it to finally happen that you kind of accept a lot. And once it becomes clear that there has been an abundance of this work, you can start having the debates we're talking about. Like, well, which of these movies do we actually really like? Or beyond having a black character in the middle, is this movie really seeming progressive about race or is it acting like, yes, she's black, but none of us are talking about that. Or, mm -hmm. And then the conversations get more interesting, which I think is what people want and where we would get if we could overcome the hurdle of there just not seeming to be anything, then we could have the conversations we really wanna have about which ones do we like or which ones do we wanna support. Absolutely. And yeah, Nick, so uh, you know, in terms of like what we wanna see and what we wanna support, um, you know, I was thinking about that and, and I, and obviously there's this need, this desire for movies to be made that, that, that star, that have characters that look like America, right? That, that, that have, um, you know, black characters and gay characters. And, um, but I noticed recently in the news, Halle Berry was supposed to be starring in a movie um, playing a trans character. And I think it became known that she was making this film because she was interviewed about it then was criticized for um, two things. One, um, in her description of the character, people felt that she was using just the wrong pronouns throughout the interview. And, and secondly, they um, didn't like the fact that Halle Berry is not um, a, tra a trans person and she was playing this character and that there, there are so many um, people out there, trans, trans people who want these roles that and the article said would kill for those roles and yeah. why are you going to Halle Berry for that role so she backed out of it and I don't know what's going on with the movie now so I'm just wondering are we on this kind of precipice of like have have characters played by actors that that embody those you know qualities I, I I'm, I'm just really more like pontificating on it and wondering if are we now at this sort of crossroads in um, casting. Yeah, it's such a hard issue. And I think it, it both, as you're saying, extends to so many different kinds of, of demographic questions around race, around gender identity, around sexuality. Um, and then also has a really particular life within each of those worlds. So it does seem especially heightened right now, I think about trans representation. Um, and the Halle Berry example you're giving is Scarlett Johansson just went through a sort of similar announcing a project and then recanting it. And both when I read, but also teaching at Northwestern and, and it's, it's robust theater school, I work with a lot of student actors you know, and, and talking to trans actors saying, 
you know, the thing is the only roles I ever seem to have a foot in the door are trans parts. And I've never, so I both don't get to act very much because there aren't tons of those roles, but also I never get to just play the nuclear physicist or the funny sidekick or the whatever. Like the roles I get are always about the fact that I'm non-binary or I'm trans. And if we were in a world, I think especially for those artists who do feel some attachment to the idea that actors should, the whole point is to try to reach outside yourself and imagine somebody else's life. And you learn the most playing characters who are removed from your experience in some ways. But since it never, ever, ever, ever happens that a trans actor is cast as a non-trans character, or, and it so seldom happens that a script that's written anticipating a white lead, some producer says, well, why don't we just cast this as a Latino role? Because Michael Pena is perfect for it. Um, it just feels like a one-way street all the time where straight actors or white actors or cisgender actors have, you know, can kind of rule the roost um, and have had the ability because there are more roles available to them so of course they have more chances to achieve success and so then suddenly they are seen as box office draws and and i understand why any actor who's not in that position whether because of gender or race or, or whatever says you know what i always hear is that but there's no box office name who's a trans actor that i can cast here and they say well when do you think that's going to happen if you don't give us any roles so it's I think once we see more cases of, and also a little more dialogue, you know, we're getting used to people being a little more transparent about their paychecks and stories where they realize that as the woman in this show or in this movie, I was being paid half as much as a guy who has only a third as many scenes as I have, what's going on. Um, I think it helps when actors are also a little more forward about this role was always meant to be a, a white lead, but I, Denzel Washington, made the case that, you know, you really want me in Philadelphia as this lawyer, both because I will learn something from playing this role, but I think my audience needs to come see this movie as much as a gay audience needs to come see it. So they changed the role. And the more you hear that stuff and encourage other people to cast adventurously, I think it, it may tilt it where later we're less sort of fundamentalist about only somebody who's exactly like the character already can play that character. But I understand why we're in that moment now, I guess. I just wanted to comment on that because, um, well, everything you said makes perfect sense. I feel frustrated because it seems, and I think you said this, there's no win, right? So Halle Berry backs out to give that opportunity, but yet on the same hand, you're saying, it doesn't seem like there's a win. You know, if you put somebody in there that's trans, then you're giving them no opportunity to get outside their box and be a, you know, a character that they aren't naturally, it's not their being. And then at the same time, if you let Halle Berry do it, then you're getting criticized for not giving those opportunities. I mean, I, you know what I mean? I can't like clearly at this moment think about how does that change or how, does, how, does, how do you fix that? Because it seems like, I don't know, there's just no clear answer of how you fix that. Yeah, and it often happens that, that that project just suddenly has a taint around it as the one that got off on the wrong foot, right? So it's rarely the case that then they find somebody else who's better casting. It usually just means that movie winds up not getting made. And that does feel like a zero sum. I agree with you. Um, and so then you, you then hear all these other artists saying, okay, but I've sold 12 scripts about trans characters having completely their... They're in different genres. They have different storylines. Um, they've all been bought and none of them are being produced. And so this one that, that worked its way up the pipeline enough that somebody almost produced it and got as far as casting it is suddenly in the media as the arbiter of are we going to get any trans movies or we're just going to have none because this one got shot down. And I think the, the most frustrating message for the artists is often there's no drought of the work. Like there are tons of projects that um, if more of them were produced, I mean, it's two things. Like there, there's a bigger reservoir you could tap into. If this is not the right movie to make, what about these other 10? Or what about these other 20? But also... I think it's so interesting that Halle Berry in particular was pulled into this because I remember when she won that Oscar for Monsters Ball and got a lot of pushback, including from black actresses who had turned that part down, saying, I am not going to play a black woman sort of 
selling her sexuality to this white death row inmate who executed her, my husband. And I, everything about this script feels problematic to me and I don't know why she's doing it. And I understood why she was saying, I think people have this idea, I have 25 scripts sitting on my coffee table and I'm going, that's the one I'll do. Um, this is the script I got that asked me to be anything except beautiful. And I saw a real opportunity here. And if we were making, you know, if dozens of movies starring black women came out in a different year, it wouldn't matter as much that this one's a little provocative and might be polarizing and people might not be thrilled that I made it or the attention might feel like a mixed blessing. And I think, I hope we get there with trans stories too, where it's like there are enough of them that the flaws or the debates around one of them doesn't feel like it's sinking the whole enterprise. Because I agree with you that until we get past that point, it's going to feel like we're not making any of the progress that we want to. Well, and along those lines, it's funny because, you know, my husband and I will be looking for movies and it's like unbelievable the amount of movies you don't want to watch. <laughs> and right. it's, it's, uh, it's like uncanny and it's not like we're going to the theater all the time. So we've seen so many of these and it's going back to your, your notion of like real dialogue. And I, I feel that movies are kind of like music nowadays where you like, it's like, you've made it really pretty like you dolled it up with a ton of makeup and a ton of production but it really like the bones of the music or the movie don't aren't really there it's kind of very static it's like your 4-4 rhythm you know and there there's not a much ha happening with dialogue and i just wanted to comment that like i'm constantly looking for like just real life like real re like ladybird was one was a movie that i saw that i was like God, it's just a movie about life. And there isn't like some big plot line or some reaching to some goal. And it was just, I like, that's like one of the few movies where I was like, I just, I just really like this movie for what it was and the dynamic and the conversation and what they were experiencing. But you, you weren't reaching for this end. And like, is there like a genre of movie that's more like that, that that's out mm. there that I just don't even know to look for those movies because they're not the big commercial blockbuster like you were talking about? That's a great question too. And there's a few things I want to say about it. One is that I have found it really helpful to save the listings for film festivals even when I can't go to them because I find that there are movies that really have to, that are never going to win the fight to get into mass release but that's where you meet a lot of the ladybirds and the moonlights and the, the more of them that didn't sort of have the shooting star trajectory. And then they sort of invisibly, there, there are movies that I just am banging my head against a wall sometimes to, you know, I got to see it because I went to Toronto and got to see it with this huge festival audience and have all these great conversations and you then want to tell all your friends and it's nowhere. And then a year and a half later, it's on Amazon Prime or it's on Netflix. And if you don't know to look for it, you won't find it. Um, but holding on to those, you know, I'll read those kinds of listings all the time. And especially if it's in a city, I'm never going to make it to, I think, well, drat, I guess I'd missed my shot, but trying to hold on to those later, the ones that I was circling, like, that's what I would go to if I could attend this festival. Um, that's sometimes the best way to find interesting stuff where there are streaming services. There's one topper film. They're a small distributor that go to festival is going to touch and not because it's, controversial or um or her impenetrable or hard to understand it's just people don't think i'll spend my friday night going i'm, I'm thinking i i discovered them through a movie called ava that i saw at the same festival where i saw ladybird when they were both brand new and ava has a lot of the same plot points as ladybird but it's set in tehran and it's what happens when you're a teenage girl who doesn't get along with your mother all that well and is treated real bad by some other characters, but you're also kind of obnoxious and get in your own way a lot of the time. And you're doing that under a really difficult regime. And um, that, that movie's gone over really well in my, in my teaching, but if I hadn't seen it at that one festival, who would know? So looking for streaming services that might not be Netflix, that are really built around, these are things that were never on anybody's radar, can help. But with apologies for talking so long, the other thing that, that the Ladybird example reminds me of, and it, it's been in my head through the conversation, even Karen, when you asked like, what are movies that would come to mind as, as kind of um, relevant to the conversation we're having, or this idea of goddesses on screen, I felt like I've constantly 
so many of the movies that came to mind when you asked me that were movies that then I realized like, oh yeah, Silkwood doesn't end that well for that woman. Like she sure gets a new sense of self being this researcher and activist and standing up to the government, but oh, the ending is bad. Or lots of movies where the character's flawed, you know, Lady Bird is not an angel or Monster's Ball is not necessarily a role model movie, you know, but there's a lot of goddessing to be found in watching people make impossible choices in their lives or know that like the fork in the road has costs on either side. Um, or Derek and I were just watching Fatal Attraction a couple nights ago. Oh my gosh, yeah. The bunny, for, the rabbit. Know, whatever reason. The rabbit. And I was the laughing, one. the rabbit. A movie that I had my one fight I remember ever having with my parents because they wouldn't take me to see it for the same reasons we were all discussing earlier. I was nine years old and I had somehow gotten my head, I've got to see this, everybody's talking about it. It's on the cover of Time. And they said, I don't think this is right for you. It's like, you guys just don't get it. I'm trying to learn about movies. And that was a script that, that uh, you know, they reshot the ending to make her more of a villain because the audience didn't like that the movie was sympathetic to her in the first draft oh. when they wrote it. Um, really? And I don't know why I'm telling this long story, but mostly to say there was a lot I learned from that character about what the after effects of abuse might look like later in your life or how you might be a deranged killer who's boiling bunnies, but you're also saying some pretty pointed stuff to this man about you don't just get to spend a weekend with me and throw me in the trash that I found really bracing. And so when we talked about, you know, just thinking about what are the movies we want to see, I don't always want to see Aaron Brockovich as much as I adore it, or a Katherine Hepburn movie as much as I wish I were more like her. I'm also just missing all the stories about mixed up trans characters and black characters who are going through whatever in their lives. It means sometimes they're making great choices and sometimes they're not. And I feel like those are maybe missing um, a lot of the time. And that it's not just from perfect role models that we learn a lot, right? Exactly. Our final question today, before we go to favorite things, uh, is how do you see the movie industry now moving forward? We are in co. I know, you know, with COVID, uh, especially, just the movie theater experience, just you know, going back to school, even you know, putting plexiglass between each desk. I mean, how are we going to sit at the theater again, if we are? I'm so interested what you all think about this also, because I think none of us has the leg up in knowing how this is going to go. Um, and so much of it seems to have to do with like, I'm still such an inveterate movie theater goer. I still go like three or four nights a week when I can swing it because we live in a city where that's possible. I think a lot of my friends are not experiencing this as a huge sea change because they've already kind of settled into most of the movies they watch, they watch at home. And and so I don't know what, what your movie habits are like if this feels like my life is barely recognizable from what it was four months ago having not been to a movie theater. But I think for a lot of people that already was not the routine. Um, well, I started off by saying that's how my parents met at the movies. I love that story. And. So they love to go to movies together. So, I mean, I too love, I mean, my birthday party when I was 11 and we went to see, oh God, my mom actually packed homemade popcorn in Ziploc bags. That was the only thing that, you know, why couldn't we just buy the movie popcorn, but whatever. We always did that too, my mom. We did you? Sneak it in too. Yeah, we, she yeah. snuck it in her purse and she passed it out. And I was like, oh, anyway, love you, mom. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I love movies. Dina, how about you? Well, I was gonna say to Nick's question there, like, so for me, I I go to the movies a lot, and it's like I do it with my girlfriends during the week, <laughs> you know, the Tuesday special day or whatever it is. Um, I look forward to it all the time. I mean, so much so that we will go see almost anything just to like get in the theater, get our popcorn, get our big icy drink. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, I mean, I miss it a lot. I, I really, I do. I mean, I have a great big TV at home with surround and so on and so forth. And it's, you know, it's pleasurable, but I, I hope that, you know, sooner than later, we're safely allowed to go to the movies. Yeah. I really miss it. But the problem is, you know, making movies now is near impossible. So there's going to be this That's kind true. of hole, right? Which could be a year or two years. I don't know, but where there's really not a lot of new content that's being that's made. Right. Um, as Nick alluded to maybe earlier, maybe it's just, two, three characters, you know, much more sort of plot, you know, story driven rather than like a major blockbuster, which requires a zillion people on set. So um, I think maybe 
I don't know, I'm hypothesizing that the types of movies that are going to be made in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months are going to look very different. Um, and how are they going to kiss? Glasses. Are they going to put saran wrap and kiss? How are, I, I how saw, are actors going to kiss? I saw something about this <laughs> recently. I don't know if it was maybe on Sunday morning or a news program where they were talking about, um, you know, having to sort of CGI kiss, you know, like I, I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine what that's going to look like, but you know, if they're standing six feet apart, it's going to be hard to do love scenes. <laughs> I think I read that one of the soap operas, maybe it was Young and the Restless, was using inflatable dolls um, in the scenes where you already know who the two characters are, but once they move to the bedroom, just understand wow. that's him, that's her. And it, it kind of blew my mind, but I guess people are trying everything. Casting their real life partners to just sub oh. in the other character during the kissing scene or the wedding yes. scene or the sex scene. Um, and do you just have to go with that? Soap opera viewers have dealt with crazier stuff than that, right? We can certainly. Yeah. It'll, yeah. it'll be interesting to see. Rachel, what do you think? Well, I was just thinking, I mean, can't they just quarantine for two weeks and then, <laughs> and then kiss? Like, I, you know, like. I guess that's what the news, that's what the news shows are doing. Well, and Alyssa, go you ahead. mentioned this potential hole of what is even going to show up in the theaters and this will never happen, but if I got to make the decisions, I'd think let's take all these movies that have only been on Netflix or have escaped people's radars. There's tons of stuff that I just refuse to believe there's not an, a curious audience. Right. And, um, all these film festival movies that yeah. you've talked about. Now, of course, I want to go back and look at all these like lists of you know best movies that were never like released into well, the theater and, and start watching them. But yeah. if they're hard to find, and as you said, Nick, I mean, unless they come out on like Amazon Prime or one of the streaming services, put those all in the theater, right? right. I mean, seems like there's a ton of it. Even so, the short films that you always see like in the Academy Awards, it's like, how can you ever see any of those? Like I, and they always look so clever and fun and Absolutely. Yeah. So Nick, maybe you can make us a list of <laughs> movies we should be seeing. My favorite thing to do. Yes. Oh, yay. And well, can we put it? I'll put it on the website. So we've got yes. a couple bits of homework for you <laughs> to okay. do while you're in quarantine. Okay. So if our viewers, listeners want to contact you, Nick, how can they do that? The, the best place is my email, which is Nicholas with an H, uh, N I C H O L A S hyphen Davis at Northwestern.edu. Awesome. And then we'll have links to him on the website. But we want to thank you, Nick, so much for joining us. You are the ultimate film goddess no. and we appreciate all of your words of wisdom about films about what you feel is happening moving forward and we can't wait to get back to the movies well i'll see you all there this has been really okay. fun to thanks for having thank me thank you up next favorite things opening up to happiness and joy for favorite things today i asked our featured goddesses as well as our guest to talk about their favorite movie of all time. Okay, who would like to go first? Alyssa. <laughs> okay, so one of my favorite movies, um, I think it was, it was, it is and remains one of my favorite movies because of how it, it was so close to something personally for me. So um, it's Thelma and Louise, came out in May, 1991, which was exactly the month that I graduated from college and road tripped from New York to California with my best friend from high school wow. in a red Chrysler LeBaron convertible. Not the Thunderbird that Susan Strand and, <laughs> and Gina Davis drove. But we drove cross country. My friend was moving out there. I was taking um, uh, a little break between college and starting law school in the fall. So I had some time on my hands for a very, very long road trip. We had so, we got so many parking tickets, speeding tickets. We had a broken windshield. We have oh so many crazy things that happened to us along the way. Nothing like what happened to them along the way, thank goodness. Um, but we also had some of our like craziest things happen to us in the Grand Canyon. And you all know the scene at the end of the movie with the Grand Canyon. <laughs> we, we just got pulled over by some park rangers for going through stop signs. Nothing nearly as bad, but also where our broken shields happen. So to say that I related to this, to this movie, to these two women, um, which by the way was so empowering. And I think for its time, these like 
incredibly like strong women who are trying to, um, one of them in particular, separate from a, a you know horrible home situation. Um, you know, and I remember the movie actually it's sized a bit for sort of paint a bad light, like okay, <laughs> but the criticism back in nineteen. But anyway, and Louise, for me, I mean, my 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 girlfriend still I call her Louise. It's just like is be um, full for us in so many ways. Love that. I, we got a, a talk later more about that. I didn't know that about you, Alyssa, that movie. Rachel, how about we had you? had some crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. <laughs> Rachel, what was your favorite of all time, if you can narrow it down? Oh, I am a sucker for romantic comedies. And again, it is an incredibly disappointing genre in a lot of ways because they just get so ridiculous and stupid that I just can't relate to a lot of them. Um, and I watch a lot of bad ones because I'm just dying for that one that, you know, that, I don't know, there's like a lot of unrequited love from high school in me. And um, so I, they, they just mean so much. And my absolute favorite movie is Love Actually. And I just love the, the weaving of all of these different love stories. And it could be any age, you know, it, it, it just spans upon all these different relationships and, and it's funny and it's real and, and you cry and you laugh and just even the opening scene with the Beach Boys song at the airport and it's talking about how everyone's looking for love and it's such a great expression of love at the airport. And I, I just think the mu movie is done beautifully. Anytime I'm flipping through the channels, if that movie is on, I will watch it from any moment <laughs> that it's in and just to the end. I love it. That movie is such a reflection of you and your personality too, because you're such a loving personality. I'm just getting to know her too, but I just, you know, she, um, I'm going to say my next, um, this is what I saw the other day with my daughter and she walked out is Splendor in the Grass. And uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's an old movie. It's been redone. I didn't realize that it's been redone, but um, it's an old movie with the characters Deanie and Bud and it stars Natalie, Natalie Wood and Warren Beatty. Mm -hmm. And it's, a love story back in the late 20s and when there was the good girl who you know only kissed if even and then the bad girl who was spoiled you know like who who would have go all the way who would have sex and there were those two characters and the good girls natalie wood who you know was to remain good and not spoiled and her mother was very it was overbearing but then there uh warren Beatty was just so they were just so in love and he just had to have sex. Like it was like he would, they were just both so sexually frustrated. She was as well. And she thought she was, something was wrong with her. Her mother said, yes, you're not supposed to be that way. And I'm watching this yesterday with my daughter and she's looking at me like, you like this movie? Cause there's one scene where they're just hugging and hugging and he pushes Natalie down to her knees. And he said, you are my slave. Cause she said, I'll do anything for you. And he says, you are my slave. And I don't remember that when I watched it when I was 17, but she's like, mom, this is sexist. This is, this is horrible. Like that you like this movie, but getting past that, the love story, cause what happens in that movie, and I'm going to spoil it. So if you are going to watch it, block this part out but they end up going their separate ways after she goes to a mental institution and he goes off to Yale and doesn't drops out and becomes a farmer but they end up going their separate ways but in the end they meet up again and they realize that they they have to accept what is they've gone in different paths and then the poem by Woodsworth intimations of immortality Though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Because I saw this movie when I just had a breakup with this longtime boyfriend, and I thought I'm never going to have love like this again. Oh, what's going to happen? Oh, so I just love that movie. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I love all those um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know why nobody's saying my favorite movie, which is almost famous. I could watch it all the time. I would change my hair to be blonde, to be Penny Lane. I, I love 
I love the sad love story of her following this this musician. I love um, all the names are escaping me besides Penny Lane. I, I love the boy that's in high school get, gets to go write for Rolling Stone and really pushes himself in that way and 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 his sort of growth. Um, Tiny Dancer is forever a song that like brings tears to my eyes. I scream it whenever it's on the radio and it's so a part of my family memories and so I just everything about it. I love it. I have parts of it that just are now probably, you know, looked at as wrong and, and the way that Penny Lane was treated and I was never a Band-Aid, um, but I something about that movie just, I love, 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 love. Nick, how about you? We'll end with your favorite movie. Before gonna, we talk about movie snacks and then we'll really end the show. Okay. Go ahead. I'm gonna sneak in a quick comment about Thelma Louise. Oh yes. I saw that in the theater. And not only felt so empowered and transported and realized like, you know, that you predict what movie's gonna resonate for what person. It gets back to that conversation about like, you know, we're all more complicated than just I can only relate to people who look like me. And, mm -hmm. and I love that Gina Davis founded that whole statistical influence institute about gender in the movies based on her experience of that. And at the same time has said, that movie had a male director and there's nobody else that Susan and I ever wanted to direct it. So it's it's not always one-to-one -one about who's gonna produce the best art yeah. about any group. Um, my favorite movie is The Piano um, with Holly Hunter. And I saw that across the street from my high school because I had to kill time between the end of the day and the school play that night that my friends were in. And they had just opened this little strip mall six screen theater and the the person who opened it thought well if i show jurassic park on like four of the screens i can show stuff that has never been playing in the suburb here on the other two screens and it'll pay for it and i'd read about that movie but didn't even understand what i was reading trying to follow a one paragraph summary of like new zealand in the 19th century and she's mute and she has this daughter and so i thought i would just go and I, it sounds hyperbolic but it really was true, true. i wanted to be a mathematician up until about that morning. And then while I was watching that movie, thought, oh no, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna wanna work on stuff like this. Like I am so blown away wow. by what every character is doing. I don't understand how this camera is underneath the boat. I don't understand how it's inside the piano. Why is she doing that? Why is he doing that? What is the bush of music? And it just <laughs> felt like I'm gonna learn so much more about the world from experiences I'm not personally having and trying to understand them than, than staying in my own bubble. Um, so direct line from watching that to being a film and gender studies professor <laughs> now. I, I can't imagine how many times I've seen it. My friends don't, you know, are up and down if they even like it, but. That's amazing. I mean, that's what we talk about in Grateful Goddesses is just stepping out of our box and like, and finding our path and finding our, our passion and, and finding that pivot point when, you know, we see that that's what we want to do. And, and we've often joked about like in our fifties, although I know Dina, you're younger, but um, what do we want to be when we grow up? We're still learning. We're still, you know, and, and going to the movies and, and having different perspectives and then looking back at movies and seeing what's changed and, and how we feel about them. I just have to say, Nick, I just got, I got the chills when you mentioned the piano because I, I kid you not, just the other day, I was thinking about that movie, like intensely. I haven't, I don't even know how long it's been since I've seen that movie. And I swear, like, I'm very much a believer in signs in life. And I yeah. really think that was, like, in preparation for meeting you. I'm like, I love that you met. I just am, like, blown away right now. Harriet Tubman and the piano. We, something's <laughs> happening here. Yes. Okay, now on to the most important thing. I brought along my bowl. I brought along, <laughs> it's not, it's not a movie popcorn, but I brought along my popcorn. I brought along my... M&Ms that I like to pour into my popcorn. That's my favorite movie treat. But I also brought along my Junior Mints, my Good and Plenty. These are some of my favorite treats. How about you guys? Rachel, what's your favorite treat? Junior Mints all the way, baby. Junior Mints. I love Junior Mints. I'm Dina? like saving them now. Dina? Um, I, I always do popcorn and I... Pour the m ms in on a good day. I know, right? Because it's warm and they, they oh. melt. Yep. How about you, Alyssa? 
I go back and forth between popcorn and like Twizzlers or anything Twizzlers. gummy, gummy bears, gummy. you know, gummy worms, gummy stuff. Okay, Nick, drum roll. What's yours? It's going to be such a boring answer. I, <laughs> my favorite snack is the movie. I never get anything. <laughs> it's just like, it's like I'm at church or having an out-of-body awesome. experience. Like, yeah, I'm hungry for two hours. That's the best answer ever. Thank <laughs> you so much for joining us on Favorite Things and Grateful Goddesses. Thank you. Unleashed your inner goddess yet? Thanks for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. We invite you to visit our website, www.gratefulgoddesses.com, to access today's show notes as well as other helpful resources. Don't forget to leave a review. Until next time, stay strong and empowered to be a grateful goddess. <laughs>